hello to everybody and thank you for joining our webinar today. I'm Isabel Ford, the marketing manager here at Anexa. So we're here today to chat about tech and fintech businesses who have experienced rapid growth. So we'll touch on how you can prioritize growth, pre growth plans and technology investments, navigate post-funding considerations, and also learn about the growth strategy and insights of global payments company Split It. So some housekeeping today, we would love to hear from you throughout the session. So we have some time at the end for a Q&A if you want to use the chat box at the bottom right of the screen to shoot through any questions for our speakers. And speaking of, a very big welcome to our speakers today. I'm joined by Ben Malone, CFO of Split It, who will also share his own learnings in playing a critical role in driving Split It's growth strategy. And Matthew Owens, director here at Anexa. So Ben and Matt, I will hand over to the both of you if you want to give a quick introduction on yourselves. So Ben, maybe we start with you. Sure. Thanks, Izzy, and thanks, Matt. Uh, it's good to be here. So yeah, my name's Ben Malone. I'm currently the CFO at Split It. Uh, I've spent around 20 or so years in, in finance roles. Um, uh, started my career in professional services, spent some time overseas uh, in, in property, and then after returning back to Australia, probably the last 10 years or so, almost exclusively in technology companies. I uh, spent some time at REA Group, uh, realestate.com.au, as may, many would know. Um, and then I went to a couple of um, uh, smaller tech uh, listed companies, one called Live Hire, uh, where I was, which was in HR technology. And then uh, I've been at Split It, which is a payments company, which we'll talk about later for a bit over two years now. Thanks, Ben. Uh, Matthew Owens is, is me, uh, Director of Sales and Marketing at Anexa. Uh, I've been in the ERP space um, for around 13 years, uh, consulting and implementing. Uh, I now head up Anexa's sales and marketing efforts. Um, thanks for joining us today, Ben. Um, obviously, over the years, been been fortunate to be able to work with uh, several CFOs. Um, obviously, been great working with you over the years. I think we've We've done three now, um, ERP implementation journeys together. Um, really appreciate you joining us today, mate, giving us the insights and, 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 and spending your time with us. Um, so maybe to kick us off, um, you could give us an overview of the Split It business. Sure. So Split It is uh, it's a reasonably small, but, but quite a complex company. Um, it was founded in Israel uh and the company then listed on the asx in 2019 um and but its primary operations are all in the us so so it's it's quite global we've got less than 100 people but we're spread all across the globe and and that translates to my own team in finance as well uh, i've got people uh here in australia um and in israel and in the us as well um at core split it's a payments technology company um it, the technology provides for installments uh installment payments on uh, on credit cards so it often gets grouped in with other buy now pay later providers but in fact it's actually very different um i'll touch on that a little now and, and go a bit deeper later but um what it is is we provide the technology that empowers um, uh, merchants uh, to offer installment payments embedded within their own customer journey so we're a white label solution. We're not a consumer brand. Uh, and we're the only technology uh, installment solution that allows shoppers to use their existing credit card uh, without increasing their overall credit exposure. So what that means in sort of basic terms, let's say you've got uh, $10,000 of available balance on your credit card, Matt, and you wanna buy a bicycle um two thousand dollars it, it it's a solution that does work well for we've got an average order value of about a thousand us dollars actually so it's it works well for higher value mm -hmm. so you've got the credit there but you don't necessarily you don't want to borrow more uh from another buy now pay later provider which is that is in, in theory all they all they are is additional debt but also you don't necessarily want to put two three thousand dollars on your credit card and have to pay that off next month so Split it allows you to use your existing credit and, and bring it further. So our tech will place a hold 
um, for the value of that purchase. Uh, and that reduces what's called your open to buy. Uh, so your 10,000 will go down to 8,000 in this case. Um, and then we'll charge monthly installments and then we'll drop that hold down. So eventually, you know, we'll charge it. It can be over three, six, nine, 12 months even. Uh, and the good thing about it for us is that having that sort of the technology is doing the, I guess, the collections process in a way, because if you ever sort of miss one of those installments, we have that hold there to fall back on. And it means that we don't, we're not exposed to the consumer losses that sort of um, the other buy now pay later uh, providers are. So for merchants, um, it drives great conversion for them. It increases their average order value because it's providing a payment option that sort of, you know, to help those drive those high value sales that a lot of people would um, actually abandon at the point of sale. Um, for shoppers, it's really seamless. Uh, there's no credit checks, there's no applications, there's no fees. You know, it's just, it's just a regular credit card transaction, basically, but you're just picking how many installments you want to do. Um, so as I said, it's, it does mean we have a very different model to other buy now, pay laters. Um, we're white label. We don't invest, you know, tens of millions of dollars in acquiring consumers because everyone with a credit card is already an inferior consumer. We just need the merchants to switch us on. Um, so that's, I mean, that's that's probably a bit of a 101, uh, I guess, uh, about Split Up. Okay, appreciate that. And so when you, you started, the state of play, Sounds like a lot. A lot's changed. Um, state of play when you entered the business. Yeah, it was. Um, <laughs> it was very different. And and look, the the sector, technology, and I mean the landscape just at a macro level has obviously changed dramatically as well. And that's been really amplified for uh, buy now pay later. Even though I would stress that I don't personally consider ourselves there. For um, we, we have really been probably dragged in with that. So. In the really early days before my time, it was your traditional kind of bootstrapped by a couple of founders type of situation, you know, venture capital um, uh, investment and things like that from some US and Israeli um, uh, investors. They IPO'd, as I said, in 2019. I came on board in 2020. Um, so at that time, it was still a very small company, but it was really growing, growing quickly. Um, uh, we were growing our key metric at the time was what we call merchant sales volume, MSV. There's several acronyms, you know, total transaction volume or whatever you'd like to call it. But basically it's the, the transactions, not necessarily our revenue that we're processing through the solution. That was growing by, you know, triple digit uh, year on year, um, but we were still quite small and we didn't have a lot of the foundations in place. Whether that's, you know, the platforms and the technology or the balance sheet, even at the time. So. Um, so not long after I joined, we strengthened the balance sheet. We raised a uh, hundred million dollars, um, uh, and brought in a lot of us and Australian institutional funds. Uh, and then we also raised 150 million us dollars, um, in a credit facility with Goldman Sachs. So in sort of very simple terms, the way that our model works, we have actually have two, but the way one of our models work is the merchants will receive the funds from us up front. We'll then collect the installments back over time. So you need a lot of working capital to do that. And that's what that Goldman Sachs facility uh, enables. So that was, you know, both those two things really enabled us to push a lot harder because we were somewhat limited to that point by the amount of money we had in the bank. Um, so, so we're in a much stronger position within the sort of first six months, but we still had to sort of deploy those funds, you know, wisely. It's all well and good to have it. You need to be able to use it. So um, in the finance team, um, you know, this often meant a lot of the foundations historically had been um, ne neglected to an extent. Uh, systems, automation, access to quality um, information uh and just driving general efficiencies uh so that that quickly became a priority uh, with the you know the strength in balance sheet to sort of invest in it um that started with building a team and the partners to help get us there so i, I really had to revamp the team find the right people to partner with me third parties to partner with me as well um to bring all that to life um as a business sort of more uh wholly it was all about growth when i first started New markets, new merchants, uh, just getting them online as quickly as possible and getting them transacting. Uh, over time, that's obviously, obviously growth and new merchants is always a priority. But over time, I think the focus has really 
shifted or, or just expanded uh, to a degree in, in terms of there's a lot more emphasis on end-to-end -end profitability um, in the sector and for us as a whole so as well. So that really what we have in now, the new metric that we're really focusing on, we would call net transaction margin. So that's sort of our, our MSV times whatever fee mm -hmm. we charge, less those variable costs, whether that's funding costs from Goldman Sachs. For many in the sector, it's consumer losses, fortunately for us. That's very small, if not next to, next to nil, uh, and other processing fees and things like that. So basically, you need to be able to extract transaction um, margin from every merchant. Otherwise, you don't have a pathway to profitability. So with that came a lot more greater need for much more granular information uh, that we probably didn't have at the start as well. So it was really just a top line only focus when I first started. Um, so I think they're probably the real changes between sort of you know what i inherited and what it sort of how it's evolved over time as well sounds like you inherited um a great opportunity uh <laughs> growing business and, and a whole bunch of moving parts um it's pretty exciting so so you, you spoke about um the business model of, of split it shifting and, and you guys becoming the white label tech provider for yep. merchants you know rather than the traditional buy now pay later credit provider Perhaps you could share your insights on, I guess, the landscape of Binat Pay Later and maybe a little bit more about that differentiator. Yep, split. yep. So, so I'd probably just expand on the on the on some of the points that I touched on earlier. So the some of the challenges I think that are facing the sector as a whole is also a good opportunity for Splitter to really emphasise where and why we are different um, because some of the things that are pressuring others is actually, you know, to our advantage. Um, so some of these themes I'd say, are the first one I'd say is business model scalability. I mean, it, it, you know, there's there's a lot of in the press about the scalability of, of buy now, pay later providers. And a lot of that comes down to the enormous amount of marketing spend required to basically build a consumer base because most others are trying to build up a, a, a base of cu customers to basically as a lead generation tool for merchants. Split it on the other hand, is trying to just enable merchants um, with our technology. We're not necessarily trying to bring a customer base. As I said, anyone with a credit card already is a split it customer. Uh, the, other, the other key one is just losses. I mean, macro conditions are worsening, bad debts are going up, you know, for all throughout the industry. And that net transaction margin line that I spoke about, that's the core cost that, that sits within that line. So again, for split it, you know, that's where to, where to, significant advantage to our peers uh, on that front as well. So I'd say that is the first one. Um, the second one can be the, the, the shopper impact. Um, and again, I think that's, I think that's coming into, uh, it's been emphasized a lot more because of the bad debts and the worsening conditions. So with that comes more late fees, more penalties and all that sort of stuff in the sector. And it, and it really, it, it puts, it has a bad, uh, it, it puts a bad impact for buy now pay later as a whole but it can also have a secondary impact on the merchants themselves because if you're a consumer and you have a bad experience with the purchase of your you know whatever it may be a pair of shoes uh, because of late fees or whatever else it is it's not that merchant that's actually charging those fees but it's going to you're going to associate that with that merchant so it really can have an impact there um uh, and for those merchants, they're really losing control, I guess, of that consumer relationship because they're having to go over to a third party to do credit checks and underwriting and applications, and then they're getting charged fees and all that sort of stuff. So I think that's really coming into play as well. And that's really why we focus on the white label. We're not trying to, there's no application, there's no anything, and we're not trying to take the consumer away. In fact, it's the complete inverse. We're actually trying to power the merchants to keep the consumer brand themselves and allow them mm. to do it. Um, the last one's regulation. That's that's really been in the press a lot, um, particularly in Australia, but it's really, uh, the UK, uh, I've noticed a lot more, and you know, it, it'll follow, no doubt, uh, everywhere. Um, you know, many see buy now, pay later just as unregulated lending um, uh, pretty much. And, and I think the screws are really tight in there as well. So again, if I bring that back to split it, we're a tech company, uh, we're not issuing new uh, consumer credit, we're just using the credit that you already have. So, and we're 
you know, the credit card industry as a whole is highly regulated and that's really where we're operating. So, so all three sort of points, I think, that are impacting the sector are also good ways of highlighting where we're different. Yeah, uh, great, great insights, Ben. I think the, yeah, for the uninitiated, it, it you know, the, with the business model competing with the, the key buy now, pay later brands that we see in the press uh, a, a lot. Um, it's great to hear about the transition of the business, shifting to B2B, supporting merchants, giving them the power and evolving that business model. It's, um, yeah, it's unique. It's exciting. So maybe you could talk a little, little further about the, the business drivers, you know, what has the business been trying to achieve? How have you been facilitating that strategy? Maybe reflecting on 12 to 24 months, you know, what, what is the business drivers? What are the strategies and, and, and I guess how they evolved in terms of the go to market? Yep. yep. So, so I think there's a few things there. I mean, there's, there's the sort of the metrics that we use and how we've, and, and how we've transitioned those and focused on other things. And there's the markets that we've chosen to focus on uh, as well uh, and the product. So it's been, uh, you know, as I alluded to earlier, it's been a, it's been quite the journey uh, over a couple of years uh, in within this sector and within this business. So, um, you know, as I mentioned earlier, it was just growth, growth, growth uh, at the start. MSV transaction volume basically just, um, uh, you know, at all costs, um, increasing losses and things like that were, you know, to a degree almost seen as secondary at that time. So we were quickly, at that time, we were quickly expanding into new markets ourselves. Um, so we were fully operational um, in the US, Canada, the UK and Europe, uh, Australia, and obviously Israel. We're not commercially operational there, but we're, we, that's where our company was founded and our technology team is still there. So from an employment point of view, we're in Israel as well. We've also, with our Goldman Sachs credit facility, we've got Ireland actually into the mix as well there too. So we, we are very global for a small company. Um, in terms of, I think, unit economics transaction margins, you know, at the time, as I said, were a little bit secondary, but that's sort of changed. Um, and there's a lot more balance now between growth at all costs and sustainable growth. So part of the journey there, I guess, has been, you know, you've got to measure those costs to acquire, the cost of service, a customer, all those variable costs in that transaction margin line that I mentioned uh, have to be tightly measured. And pricing as well is a really critical tool. So, you know, around the sort of billing engines and things like that to be able to analyze at a per merchant basis, which merchants are driving the greatest revenue and transaction margin importantly as well. So that's all been quite an evolution. Uh, and what we do today is very different to what we did two years ago when I started on, on that front as well. Um, we've even at times led, that's led us to take in sometimes a more conservative approach. So, you know, for example, a merchant might deliver good MSV, but if it's not going to be profitable for us, we may be better off not taking that merchant. We may be better off having a, a tough conversation with a merchant over time as well, um, because that's a, quite a dynamic environment with the costs as well. So sometimes price doesn't need to move. So, so you need, you really need access to data to be able to make quick decisions uh, when you're doing that as well um, and, and that's obviously with margins sort of you know under under scrutiny that's that's even more important um, and we've got examples where we have done that we've we've pulled back on some merchants and done other things like that um, so what that's meant is our msv what was our one and only metric while still a very important metric still growing and still going quite strong it's not necessarily going to grow at 100 and 200 percent year on year like it was back then but what we are finding is our transaction margins are actually growing at significantly higher rates now than what they were two years ago so whilst the optics of of that top line might not be the same actually the underlying health of the business in my mind is actually much greater um and as i said that's that's at a time when a lot of our peers are really struggling on that transaction margin line uh, as well so you know, again, point of difference. I know I keep saying it, but but it is important. Um, so I think that's yeah, that's that's probably how we've taken it over the over the last couple of years, and and where the focus has shifted to. Okay. Are there any other markets that you guys are interested to to enter? Um, is the focus very much those core markets that you mentioned now, or or are there any, any other sort of expansion plans? Yeah. yeah so it's interesting. We've if anything, pulled back slightly on some of that. I think one of the learnings is, um, you know, when you're, 
you know, quite small and you've only got so much capital to deploy, uh, going to sort of six, seven different markets at the same uh, out of the gate is, you know, is a big, is a big effort. So, so I would say if anything, it's, it's probably a little the other opposite direction in that we're really laser focused on the U S uh, and we're really, n the others, the others are somewhat secondary. We're still set up to operate there and we still do, but they're really being targeted more for a global merchant, for example, that comes out of the U S or another market that wants to expand into other regions. So we're set up as opposed to targeting, I guess, say Australian only, you know, merchant or a UK only merchant, it would be more a global merchant, one out of the U S that needs to expand. Um, and we've had instances, we do have instances where that happens. We do have some large global merchants on the books. Um, we did do a uh, merchant in Japan, actually. That's probably one that was non-core. That was, um, that was Google. Um, so obviously, you know, the, the beauty of the technology, it is pretty easy to expand globally. Um, so there will always be edge cases and, you know, for a merchant like that, again, that has that potential for global expansion. That was a that was a non-core market that was worth looking into because it could lead to greater things. Gotcha. Yeah, clearly some yeah significant opportunity out of the US and and a lot of global merchants available for you guys to tap into there. So that that makes sense. A lot of moving parts to mobilize a business and all the the things mm -hmm. behind it. Um, so that, that makes sense. Okay. Um, so lots to navigate. Um, many moving parts, evolving business strategy, all sorts of things going on. From the shoes of the CFO, obviously lots of challenges to, to navigate, um, to set the business up for the scale that you've been um, experiencing. Uh, how did you work through prioritizing your your initiatives, your projects, and and translating the business strategy into a set of um, initiatives? Yep, yep. So uh, it was pretty hard at the start. Um, the so the sort of the finance function was pretty. Uh, nascent uh, at best and, and a lot of the basics sort of had to be done. Um, so we had to implement new finance systems, NetSuite obviously, but also, uh, you know, uh, Expensify for expense management. We use a thing called Moody's Analytics, which is sort of a, a loan management system for our funding product. Um, and we've got, obviously we're a FinTech, so our core product is is moving money around in his finance too. So, so we had to sort of get all of those sort of moving parts up and running um, uh, at the same time. Um, our corporate structure, you know, uh, as I said, covered sort of six, seven ge geographies as well. Um, a lot of the processes were quite manual. The controls were lacking at times and the access to data was, was uh, a challenge as well. Um, so the initial focus, I guess, was kind of the basics and that, that that did start with uh the NetSuite implementation because uh from past experience um uh as you know matt working together it's um my view is that until you get that sort of that the uh, the core or the base sort of stable everything else becomes quite hard and if you want to scale in a cost effective way sometimes a little bit of upfront investment in those areas will pay off um you know more than pay off into the future because the alternative, quite frankly, for us would have been a bloated team doing manual, manual processes, manual reconciliations, um, given that we are, as I said, a, a, a company that at its core is moving a lot of money around globally uh, and it's quite complex and it has to be very, you know, tightly controlled. So we needed a global multi-currency consolidation. We needed quick access to financial reports, lots of integrations to and from internal and external systems, as well as putting some of those systems in place. Uh, we had Salesforce, obviously, with a lot of master data that needed to talk to those systems to pricing, billing, all of these things had to be done. Uh, but we started with NetSuite and we sort of built out um, from there uh, to a large extent. So that's kind of how we thought about it when I first, first started. Perfect. No doubt a lot of other yeah, CFOs and financial controllers probably sitting in in a similar position at the moment. Um, no doubt they'd be uh, very wise to compare notes with you and just chat about what you experienced and how you navigated that. Um, but clearly a solid strategy, you know, getting the core foundations in, particularly given the geography of your team with everyone all around the world and obviously with your businesses in the six different countries. Um, yeah, it makes sense. Um, no, I appreciate that, Ben. So, mate, reflecting on our journey together, um, partnering with Split It as a Nexa and to assist with all, all of this. 
sitting back, reflecting on what you've achieved and where you're at now, perhaps you could share um, some insights into what you're experiencing, what the outcomes and benefits are to, to yep. split it. Yep. So look, as I said, look, what I, from what I inherited uh, and the challenges that we had to where we are now, and, and yeah, it's never done. There's, all, there's always going to be you know improvement, and we're still we're still working on certain things. But I um, mean, we manage tens of thousands of individual transactions with a very small team in a listed environment as well, where we're subject to a lot of audits um, uh, and scrutiny. Uh, so from where we were to where we are now, I mean, it's it's sort of night and day to an extent. So you know, we have a lot of clear data, we can reconcile it, we can agree it to core systems, and we can actually use that information to actually drive business insights, uh, which we just couldn't do at start. Um, so like as an example, once we set up a lot of those basics, I then set up a FP&A or commercial finance um, function. Um, uh, it was it was actually something that was interesting. I, I can still recall when I started, the CEO wanted me to prioritise that needed to you know get out drive more value into the business but I push back to an extent on him because hiring someone with no access to any information was largely going to be a waste of money and a waste of someone's time as well so so it wasn't disputing the importance of it it was just disputing the order of priority so once we had the basics set up we hired that function uh, out of the US um, and and look you know, she partners with the sales and marketing um, and commercial functions on a daily basis. Um, you know, uh, I don't, she's c considered, she's part of the finance team, but, you know, she, she could almost be considered part of the sales team. Um, so that's that's been obviously a, a big win for us. Um, we switched auditors uh, throughout the process as well. Uh, we've not only we switch in firms, we also switch countries and our audit was actually even previously done in another language in another country. So just to add, you know, a little bit more um, complexity to it. So it's never an easy task to, to do all of that stuff. And and you've got to have pretty good information to because in early stages with a new one, when they're coming up to speed, you know, that the work involved is a lot more. But we've done all that with a very small team. Um, you know, it's what is it today, the 13th of July. You know, the accounts are, are long since closed. We've prepared all of our quarterly reporting for the markets. We've prepared our draft statutory accounts, you know, for the auditors, all the other information for the auditors. I mean, we just could not have done that um, uh, two years ago, not even close. Um, so, I mean, to do it, I mean, we needed, as I said, you need people, you need partners. Um, so, um, so we sort of picked the phone up and then spoke to yourself. Um, uh, and we've obviously, you know, done it before and worked together before. So, um, so I think that's, you know, to be able to sort of partner, not with just the business, but with me personally, because it's been a partnership that's gone through three businesses, um, has made it a lot easier. Um, so yeah, good people, good, pa good partners, good systems. And, you know, we've come a long way in two years. I yeah, appreciate that, Ben. Yeah, it's always good when we we know how we each other you know works and and um, you know there's confidence there in the teams just to get in and, and get on with it. Um, but clearly some great outcomes. I think the the FPNA inside is is a good one. Um, you know, we work with many businesses that don't have that function in terms of um, planning capabilities with any real sophistication. Um, great next step. So it's good to see you guys get the core systems and get the platforms use the data to be able to power that function. Um, yeah, that, that's actually a really good insight. I think um, a lot of NetSuite customers out there are sort of looking at those financial planning solutions and how to how to drive that and make it happen and get the right people. So good discussion point, no doubt. Um, so if you had to summarize, you know, your key learnings uh, across the journey, you know, we've got a, a bunch of people here, no doubt tuning in that are in a, a similar uh, position in order to grow and scale their business. You know, what, what would your key learnings and insights be if you had to summarize it um for the group for the audience um i would say i think there's a few themes um i think we've spoken a bit about the sort of core core platforms systems processes you got to set them up for scale you know you have to get those you know it's not the sexiest stuff and and sometimes it can be a bit of a point of friction because um particularly in my instance being sort of the first cfo coming into this company you know, there was a tendency for everyone to want everything immediately, but I had to sort of really sort of almost 
for, <laughs> force that argument that, that we had to get the basics right before we could sort of uh, get into that other stuff. So I think, you know, that was difficult at times in terms of those conversations, but ultimately the CEO did support me a lot. So that was obviously very beneficial for me. Um, to do that, you need the right people and the right partners uh, to get there quickly um, and effectively. So um, like yourselves, I also, you know, had a few other people who I've worked with in, in a few roles and um, and we've all sort of, you know, familiar with, with the Nexa and the team as well. So it was quite good having not just me, but almost a little mini project team uh, <laughs> ready to go. Um, not everyone can be so lucky, but, but I, I, you know, I think you, you've got to really value the relationship that you have with your key partners and people. Um, and then, you know, you've got all that in place. Well, then, so what? You need to be able to do something with it. So, um, you know, you need to be able to then prove your value. Uh, you can't just finance, can't just be a bookkeeping function. Um, so I think once you've got the data there uh, and you've got the support to get, you know, build that team and build that function, then you've got to use it. So use it to drive more insights, you know, um, uh, the basics just need to be done uh, well once you've got the foundations in place. And then it's really about adding value to the business. Um, so that could be, you know, could be, it could be help drive decision making on new investments, where to allocate capital. It could even be more defensive things, like if you have to pull back in certain areas, reallocate investments, but you need the data to prove it. Um, it can't just be gut feel. So um, I think in my experience at other roles, um, finance or, you know, a lot of people call it like back a house, which, you know, I hate that term, but it can get left behind. Um, and it's it's understandable why it happens in an early stage company. And I've, I've done a few early stage companies. Um, there's only so much there's only so much access to funds in the early days and you've got to grow the business you know, first and foremost so but once they do once a business does have access to a different level of funds and it's moving out of i guess that startup phase and into that scale up phase and i think all the things and that's the sort of phase of business that i quite enjoy working in then i think all those things that i described become sort of more and more um important because otherwise you'll you'll fly blind without any information and you're going to end out, as I said, needing extra resource to manage all these sort of things. It'll probably end up costing you a lot more than it would to just invest in some of the systems and the processes up front and get it right. Um, so it, it is a matter of timing in terms of when you, <clears throat> when you invest, but, but, you know, I think from experience, it's an investment that was worth worthwhile. As I said, I was lucky. I had some CEOs in this role and the previous one that, that supported me to do that, but it took a bit of, explaining put it that way convincing arguing whichever way you want to say um but you know we can sit back now and say that we sort of add value to the business and um and we can scale with the business as well so that's excellent no, great insights so um what's next for split it um yeah so look we've uh we had a new ceo join us in march so he's still pretty new um, but he's, you know, he's, he's hit the ground running and he's, he's going at a million miles an hour and he's brought a couple of other um, um, sort of new faces to the team. So that's freshened things up. Um, very fintech focused. He's, he's actually started and sold a couple of fintech uh, companies before. So, so he's really, you know, playing, I guess, to the strengths of this company, which is, you know, we're, we're really a technology company at our core, not a consumer financing company or a payments, payments mm -hmm. business. Uh, and that's sort of his uh, bread and butter. So looking forward, look, I think we'll, we'll be driving a lot more sort of the white label, the tech focused sort of solution that'll be through new larger merchants, but also a very partner led approach as well. Um, so to help sort of you know, distribute the solution sort of at scale. There's a lot of a lot of payments businesses and partners in the US, particularly, um, who have already got huge amounts of merchants on their books. Uh, and if Split it can sort of become the embedded instalment offering uh, that they can offer and take out to market, then we can really scale the business uh, quite quickly. So, a bit of work to get us there, but. Um, but we do think we've got a lot of the sort of the, the foundational stuff done. And, you know, if we can win a few of these things, then we can sort of start to take off again uh, at a pretty rapid rate. Great stuff. Thanks, Ben. Um, obviously, really appreciate the partnership and being part of the, the growth journey with you guys. Um, and very much look forward, looking forward to you know, hearing more about Split It in the press and the continued growth. So thanks for joining us. Right. Thanks, Matt. I think we've got some uh, Q&A. 
Yes, thanks, Matt. Um, so I can see that we have had a couple of questions come through, so I'll jump right in. So this first one for you, Ben. How difficult was the initial transition to the core platforms you're using now, e.g. NetSuite? Um, look, easier. Um, probably easier for me than, than maybe for others because, as I said, um, I know the I know you know the partners and I know the people and I know the systems and I've done it before so I think that certainly helped um, uh, once you've got something that works it's it's hard to sort of go and, and look for <laughs> look for something else so um, it, look it still requires a lot of work and, and the complexity for us was around a lot of the integration sort of uh, stuff and planning it right up front and doing it in the right order like we've put in new billing system we've got integrations to and from Salesforce to and from our core uh, in, internal platform. Some of the complexity for us as well was where our, our tech teams in Israel. So we've got to, you know, get a, a team in Israel working with partners in Australia and me in Australia and potentially someone else in America. So making all that work come together. Um, but the ways of working these days, I mean, the world's very global and, um, you know, time zones can be a little bit of an inconvenience from time to time, but that ultimately, you know, it, it worked pretty well. Um, I think if we were all sitting in the same room, uh, we probably would have got it done even quicker. But, but you know, all things being said, I think it was pretty good. Mm -hmm. And have you found significant growth and opportunity in the Australian market or is the market opportunity mostly sitting within the US? Uh, yeah, the latter. So Australia has probably never been a a core focus for split it it was probably somewhat secondary um it was also a tougher market it's a tougher market to come into because there's a there's a predisposed sort of thinking on buy now pay later again i would reiterate that i believe we're very different but that you know th that's that's the default position of many people and australia for whatever reason was really led the charge with buy now pay later so um so it was a tougher market to come into, potentially seen as being a bit later to the party versus America, which is actually earlier stage. And there's a lot more open opportunity there. So much bigger market. It's also where our key people are and our key partners are. And we're a global solution. So we're not as restricted in what a lot of others are, where it's hard to move into expanded markets when you're a consumer financer, financier because you're subject to regulation. So, so we can do it. But as I said earlier, we are considering the US the core and the other markets uh, for expansion opportunities when global merchants present themselves. Okay, great. Uh, well, that's all we have for questions at the moment. So I'd like to say a big thank you again to our speakers um, and for all of you who joined us today. So our session will be available on demand if you want to revisit any of the topics that we have discussed. Um, and as always, we would love to hear about your own businesses and goals. So please reach out to the Anexa team. Um, we really appreciate your time today and I hope you have a great rest of the afternoon.